I should give a, a few acknowledgements. First, I'm indebted to my, uh, I, I have multiple words to re describe the Reverend Sanderson, but first of all, he's a friend of mine, but he also happens to be a doctoral student of mine um, as well for arranging this. I wanted to throw one thing back to the Reverend Sanderson as well. Um, when you define your PhD topic, you try to give people, narrow it down to a manageable topic. And I think the future of, Christi of Christianity, the role of Christianity in Africa's future is a little bit broad. Um, I will indeed try to narrow it down. I also want to start, in a sense, by way of an apology. I'm very aware in this context that probably too many white Englishmen, particularly ones with grey hair like me, have tried to tell people what the future of Christianity for Africa might be. And that's not really my job. Um, what I am is somebody who's, I, I, would, I would hope you understand after the lecture that the Christian, the way that I live my Christian life has been shaped more by Africans than it has by other people. So I've learned a lot from Africa, um, not just Ethiopians, probably principally um, Ethiopians. But it's those people that have shown me the sacrificial life that has meaning. And I do intend to speak of what I've learned from my friends, but also what my own reflections on mainly what I've seen in Ethiopia, but also an understanding of Christian history, what they offer. I think as well as a starting point to say that Western Christians have failed dismally to take seriously the vibrant and blossoming Christianity on this continent, as well as in other parts of the world. It's common in our uh, syllabus in Britain to have a course called World Christianities. And um, I have taught such courses, and it, they, they appear a little bit like what I've described as a Victorian zoo or circus with strange things lined up in cages that are objects of fascination, but not objects or not people or experiences to be learned from. I once dared to suggest to a senior professor in Cambridge, I won't name him, that wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have a course where our students could learn from African Christians. And he looked at me blankly as if to say, we understand theology, it's our job to tell others. I was horrified. This is a lamentable shortfall, and I have done my small part to try and rectify that. So I spend a lot of my time trying to help Western Christians understand at least what I know about Ethiopia. I also want you to understand that I don't assume that what I know of Ethiopia automatically transfers here. There's a lot I could say about that, but I think there's plenty in common. Your nations have something in common, um, not least of which are very, very good runners. Um, and I have delighted in, in the, the tight competition between the two nations. I'm not a runner myself, but I did used to meet Haile Gebre Selassie in the car park when I was picking up my kids from school because they were at the same school. So that's my claim to fame there. I'm going to talk about three main topics, okay? So those of you that have to send an email to uh, Reverend Sanderson, take note. There are three things that I think are the contribution that Christianity can make to this continent, but also further afield. And one of them I've put under the broad topic of the hard work of understanding. The second, the celebration of diversity, which we do in this room as we sit together. But then the final thing, the imperative of unity. Those don't necessarily speak for themselves, but I, um, I do hope by the end that they'll make some sense to you. I think as a broad summary of my experience from Ethiopia, and I'm indebted actually to a, um, one author who's helped me summarize this, there's something that I admire about the Christianity, the ancient Christianity of Ethiopia. Now this is not 
I'm not trying to suggest that the world needs to follow that Christianity. But what I'm saying is I see a country that has been shaped and formed by Christian influence for about 1,700 years. That's longer than the United Kingdom has faced that influence. And one thing you are sure about when you see Ethiopian Christianity is that they have made it their own. Their Christianity is not an imitation of anybody else's. Yeah? They have interpreted things that they have received, but they have not imitated them. And that may lead to some things that you regard as problematic, but nevertheless they have done that, and they've done it in a profound way. And I'll talk a little bit about that. I did also want to say, before I sort of sail off, you know, I have, I, I have very little experience of this place, but I do want to commend the institution and your, the, the goals that you have here. Uh, the transformational outlook of this institution is something that I have a deep respect for. And I can assure you of it being in my prayers for your futures that um, you become influencers, people who can change and form your society. So, first topic, the hard work of understanding. I'm indebted to an African for introducing me to thinking about this. Most of you will have heard of Kwame Bediako. Um, I have a great deal of respect for him. One of the summaries of one of his uh, great works, the theological achievement of early Hellenistic Christianity in the second century and the emergent theological self-consciousness of African Christianity in the 20th, and I would have to add now the 21st century, belong to one and the same story. Interesting, if you ever read Kwame Badiaka's book on theology and identity, in other comments he made after writing that is that he wished, when he studied early Christianity, he wished he'd had a chapter on Ethiopia the texts and the sources were inaccessible to him. If we are to bring Christ's fragrance to our world, then we must understand it. We need to get under the surface of what is going on around us. We need to understand what drives people, how they think, and why they make the choices they do. Actually, understanding it is not enough. We can't just be at a distance. We must take on what we see around us, see for ourselves how thinking that is not shaped by what God has revealed in Christ must be challenged. In his book, he's actually quoting another uh, writer called um, Hort. Bediaco says what he, he's talking about the second century of Christianity. So what Clement of Alexandra once humbly and bravely attempted under great disadvantages at the beginning of the third century, will have to be attempted afresh if the Christian faith is to hold its ground among men. And when the attempt is made, not a few of his thoughts and words will probably shine out with new force, full of light for dealing with new problems. So I think the important thing that we need to understand there is that the early Christians thought deeply, they understood and then they worked at changing the things around us. Their understanding wasn't superficial. They really understood how people who were not Christians thought, as well as understanding their own faith. I thought it's interesting that in that quote it talks about great disadvantages. Many people um, in Kenya and in other nations of this country could easily talk about the great disadvantages that they have. And we share that with the early church which, of course, at the time of his writing, was still facing opposition from all sorts of other groups. And in his own study, Bediako did something that reaches far beyond the borders of his own native Ghana. He picked up the outlook from Clement um, that became a habit of the city of Alexandria. We shouldn't forget, of course, that Alexandria is actually on this continent, even if it's right at the top of it. We often talk about culture, and culture can be a bit of a sloppy word, but I'm talking here about the ideas, the customs, and social behavior, things that we see around us. And actually, it ought to astonish us. 
if as Christians, instructed by St. Paul, that we should have the mind of Christ, it should astonish us that if as Christians we think just like everybody else and we make the same assumptions and we do the same things. One very formative experience for me living in Ethiopia, which I think is an example of how Christian thinking just transformed people. I'm a lot older than most of you, so most of you are probably too young to know or remember the end of the communist period of Ethiopia. But I'm talking about a period in 1991. Um, so most of the people in this room weren't born then. I was working in Ethiopia. So at the period I'm talking about, there'd been a long running civil war, but very suddenly the rebel armies fighting the communist government took about a third of the country in a few months. We saw a great threat to the government. Many of the government troops fled from the war front and they came to Addis Ababa because they had no other place to go because the rebels were closing in and in on the city. One of the most astonishing things I've ever seen, I had a, about a 10 minute walk from my house to my office. I was teaching chemical engineering in Addis Ababa at the time. So one day I counted over a hundred soldiers on my 10 minute walk lined up along the streets. All of them had guns, hand grenades, some more serious weapons. Not one of them used their weapons to threaten people to get food. With their guns in their hands, they sat on the streets begging for food. I found myself in wonder at what was going on, particularly as the atrocities of Mogadishu and Monrovia were not that far in the past at that time. Just before the change of government, I was at a meeting at the British Embassy when they were telling us we needed to leave because it would be a bloodbath. And a distinguished British man who was a historian of Ethiopia and a friend of Haile Selassie stood up and he said, no, no, the Ethiopians won't do this. All I can say to cut a long story short is that they didn't. We had a very, very quick and quite peaceful transition. What am I pointing to? Something was different about Ethiopia compared to, say, Mogadishu. And the only thing I can identify in my own experience, my observations in asking people, is 1,700 years of Christian influence on society. So those soldiers with that influence, whether they were Christians or not, but this, this influence has been so strong in Ethiopia, they didn't think to use their weapons to threaten people. I think that's astonishing. I think also, I'm, I'm going to run out of time if I go too much in, into too much detail, but I know that some of you in your classes have thought about the creed, the Nicene Creed, the I believe. I know you, you have because we were just talking about it in your class. It's a very interesting thing to study that creed and how another Alexandrian, Athanasius, had a real influence on the forming of the language. What he had done in an extraordinary way was understand what other people were saying about Jesus Christ. These people were Gnostics. And he said it wasn't just that they could have their own ideas and he was going to have his own ideas. He understood that the way that the Gnostics understood the gospel simply did not work. And he took them on in a fight. And the language of the creed reflects that fight. Athanasius was the patriarch in Alexandria for 35 years, for some years after Nicaea. 17 of those years were in exile because he was still fighting that fight. He was so committed to what he understood Christ had revealed that he was prepared to go through that um, for him. Now, of course, it's hard for you to associate your own experience with Athanasius, but you're all trained to be thinkers. Yes, you're lawyers, you're environmental scientists, computer scientists, I can't remember all the subjects. 
But you can do the same in your environment, even just looking at the way people work. Think about what people's attitudes are to work. Think about how they do their work. Who do they do their work for? What drives them? And people like you can change your workplace because you're thinking about how would this work better if I did it in the light of who Jesus Christ is? Now that takes a bit more unpacking. I'm, I'm not going to have the time to, to discuss that at great length, but we could talk about it afterwards if you're interested. I think it's an absolute imperative for us all, and it's something that needs to keep going on. Yeah? We can't just take the creed written in the fourth century. We have to think about the challenges today and the diverse problems that we, we face. So that's the, the hard work of understanding. I think you must do it if the Christianity of this continent is to remain vibrant and influential. That's an imperative, as it is for Christians in Britain or anywhere in the world. My second topic was the celebration of diversity. And I'm indebted to another African for a, a wonderful quotation. Lamin Sana is a great scholar and um, all of his works are well worth a read. His um, very simple sentence that inspired me on this was him saying that the original language of Christianity is translation. Um, why is that relevant to the ideas of diversity? Let me, let me take you through this. It's a rather unique thing about Christianity. Let's say when we compare it with other religions, other world religions, that we actually know almost nothing of the actual words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Almost all that we have are in translation. We have a few. Why we have those few is perhaps a puzzle. It's really important, not just in translating the Bible, but in translating the messages into our context that we learn to do what some people call contextualization. Kwame Bediaka would teach us that the church has always done contextualization and we need to keep on doing it. Maybe you've had these experiences yourself, but I had a very moving experience in Ethiopia. An old professor um, who was from the southern part of Ethiopia, um, this is the area where the Protestant church grew very strongly in the early 20th century. And Professor Alamayo had grown up speaking the language Walaitenya, and then he'd gone to school, and he was um, then trained in civil engineering. He'd become a very distinguished uh, professor. I knew the, the team who were working on the Walaitenya translation of the Bible, and they kindly gave me a copy when they heard I had a Walaita man that I was working with. This man was in his 80s. So I gave him a copy of the Walaita Bible, and he opened the beginning, I think, of John's Gospel, and he read about five words, and he burst into tears. Uh, he burst into tears, and he said, I've never heard this in the language that my mother spoke to me. And this is a man whose life had been formed and shaped by the Gospel, but yet having it in his own language made such a powerful difference. I was just about to make a point about how important the Greek of the New Testament is, and my Greek professor has just walked into the room. I'm not saying that Greek's not important, but I'm saying that translation is also really important. This is an extension of a discussion on understanding the culture around us, yeah? That actually language and culture come together, um, the way we say things the way we can't say things in traditional Amharic. There's no word for the word in English, no. Yeah? I remember some people living in the town I was living in, they were really struggling with their houseworker because they said, they're always lying to us. And I said, well, how do you ask them questions? They, they asked closed questions that demanded an answer, yes or no. So I said, well, why don't you try asking in another way, open questions? 
and about a month later they came and they said to me, it's amazing, she stopped lying. Now their perspective shocks me that they still spoke like that, but they hadn't worked out how people thought and so they couldn't interact. There's lots of wonderful stories. The reason that Reverend Samuelson and I can study Ge'ez is because very early in the church, people wanted the Bible and the liturgy in their own languages. Now that presents a problem in Ethiopia now because it's no longer the language. But nevertheless, these early translations, we have Armenian, we have Georgian, Syriac, diverse translations. There's a wonderful story from the history of the church in the ninth century two missionaries, one of my favorite stories, teaching world Christianity, trying to help them understand. Two men called Cyril and Methodius were asked to go to Serbia. The Serbs were developing their culture and they wanted literature. So they wanted Christianity to bring them literature. That's how the story starts. So Cyril and Methodius encountered a culture that didn't know the gospel, but also had no writing. Some of you may know that the alphabet the Russians now use is called Cyrillic. It's named after Saint Cyril, who was a great linguist, who not only translated the Bible and the liturgy in the ninth century, but he also invented an alphabet in which to do it. That was hard work. He also had a terrible fight with German bishops because the German bishops thought that he should give them the, the gospel in Latin. They nearly died because of that. I have a story, I don't know, Dr. Black, whether you remember Donna from the translation team in Addis Ababa, working on the Walaita Bible. So Donna is an American, she's from quite a conservative Christian background, like many people here. She's a brilliant and godly woman. She's translating the Old Testament. And she gets to 1 Kings chapter 6, and there's a rather peculiar description of the folding door of the temple. And she's trying to work out, how do I do this in Walaitenya? How do I explain this? So one day, in the early evening, she's driving through the back streets of Sodo, in the southern part of Ethiopia, and she drives by a bar full of men drinking, but the door of the bar has a hinge in the middle of it. So she screams to her driver, stop the car. This is the, probably the first and the last time in her life that Donna went into a bar. And she went to the barman and she said, what do you call that? And she got the word to describe the temple door. What I admire about Donna was her passion to get it over in a way that people understood. Most of you are not going to be Bible translators either. Maybe some of you will be. Yeah? So how does this relate to you? Well, I think, I think it... It means many things because, of course, translations always wear out, which is why Greek remains so important. There you are, I got it in twice. Yeah? <laughs> um, Christianity actually needs to constantly go through a process of reform, a constant move towards identifying with the local setting. And even if you're not a linguist, that's something that you can do that brings change to those around you. And then that, the vernacular, the local way of understanding things, is a driving power for renewal. And, and that brings revitalization, not just to the church, but to society. Yeah? If you live your lives well and influence people in this way, your Christian faith changes all those around you, not just those in the church. How am I doing for time? <laughs> I'm okay. So I think this is interesting. I, I, I love the idea that we go, you know, we were trying to work out how many different tribes and nations were represented in the class I was in earlier today. I don't think we reached a number, but it's quite high. In Ethiopia, there are 75 official languages and probably an awful lot more um, that are not official or spoken by smaller groups. That leads, I think, to a problem that is more of an, a worldwide problem than just an African issue, I think. And that's about the unity of the church. We need to find some way of generating interdependence. Now, in this context, 
that must not mean that one nation has dominance over others and that take, that's then dressed up as unity. I think what, what, what it must mean, however, is that it, that it involves some way of bringing us together over key values and aspects of the gospel message. The influence for me actually points its finger towards my own nation and European and North American nations. Two great prophetic speakers for me. One was Andrew Walls from Birmingham um, and another Leslie Newbigin, who was a great influence um, on many people, spoke of the need of the Western church um, to listen to the voice of the majority world. In fact, Leslie Newbigin said it was the way to re-evangelize countries like mine where people are indifferent to Christian faith. So as I say, it's more directed towards the, church, the Western church. We in the West, we need you. Yes? We need to hear your voice. We need to understand how Christianity can form this vibrant expression in such diverse ways. It's astonishing to me how many churches in my country are just not interested. I, I work for an organization called The Navigators, um, and Navigators has missionary work all over the world, but also in Britain. We learned recently that there has been a, 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 a Nigerian Navigator group meeting in Britain for 10 years and the national director of the navigators in Britain didn't know they existed until three months ago. Now, I think actually the fault lies on both sides. That group of Nigerian Christians were quite inward looking, but also the rest of us weren't looking, okay? We need this interaction. My, my work has given me the huge privilege of visiting far-flung places um, to talk about the message of the gospel in various ways. I remember not that long ago, I went to a, a meeting in Alaska in an anchorage. And as I was traveling, I was reading the prophet Isaiah, talking to, about you people from far away who are to listen. I think that's the furthest I've ever been from where Isaiah would have said those words. The, faith, the Christian faith is astonishing in the way that it has morphed and changed and adapted itself to different contexts. But we desperately need to understand and learn from you people. So in a sense, perhaps that's an even broader topic than the one Reverend Samuelson gave me. This is the future of African Christianity for the world. But I can't say it enough. If we fail to learn from this vibrant expression of Christianity on this continent, then it, we may just need more African missionaries coming to Britain and other places to teach us what the gospel is, because we will have forgotten. I think that brings what I want to say to a close. I think it's a reasonable appeal to finish with, and maybe we should just hand over some questions. Yeah.